Hey everyone, today marks the beginning of our Email Etiquette 101 unit. And in this unit, we're going to be covering the basics for sending effective and professional emails. So first, before I get too far ahead of myself, I want to remind you that you should be following along with this lecture video by filling in the Email Etiquette 101 note-taking guide. And you can find that guide posted on Schoology just below this lecture video. First, let's talk about what email etiquette is. Email etiquette is just a general set of expectations regarding how people should communicate when sending electronic mail. In other words, these are just rules that you should follow when you're sending a professional email. Next, why does email etiquette matter? First, email etiquette matters because of digital citizenship. Your online reputation matters. No one enjoys receiving a rude or confusing email. Next, email etiquette matters because of building certain skills. Communication is actually listed as one of the most valuable skills in the educational and professional world. So it's important to know how to effectively communicate no matter what type of platform you're using. And also it matters because of adaptation. As we've seen in the year 2020, more and more of our lives are becoming online. And so as society evolves, we rely more and more on digital communication. Email is often listed as the preferred method of communication in the educational and professional world. And so it's important for us to know how we can follow those rules to send effective emails. I want to also remind you that this unit is not just learning about how to write emails to make your teachers happy. This is also because your needs matter too. So we know that when we send emails, it's typically, typically because we have some sort of question or we need something done for us. When we follow basic email etiquette rules, we are more likely to have our needs valued, heard, and respected. That means we're more likely to have done what we want to have done. This next slide just shows you the perks of following email etiquette. The first is professionalism. If you know how to write an effective email, you will come across as someone who knows what you're talking about. Also, a benefit of following email etiquette is efficiency. Well-written emails increase understanding, which means that you're more likely to have what you need done faster. Also, there's a high level of respect for people who follow email etiquette. Well-written emails allow you to show and earn respect. And lastly, there's cooperation. The recipient of your email is more likely to partner with you to fulfill your requests. On these next few slides, I'm going to be sharing tips with you that you can use to write effective emails. The first tip that I have for you is that you should include a clear, direct subject line that mentions the topic of your question. That way, when your recipient opens up their email, just by looking at the subject line, they'll know exactly what your email is going to be about. An example of that says, question about reading journal. That subject line lets me know exactly what the sender of the email is going to be asking me about. Note, the subject line is not for writing your question. I see that time and time again, so many students will just write their question in the subject line and then the body space of their email is left blank. When we're writing professional emails, we don't wanna just write our email straight in the subject line. Tip two. You should always begin your email with a professional salutation or greeting. Be sure to spell the recipient's name correctly. So an example of that might be, Dear Mrs. Johnson, or Good morning, Mr. Smith. Just some sort of professional salutation. For tip number three, we want to avoid exclamation points in all caps. Why? Because when we use exclamation points, they look a little bit informal. Furthermore, all caps makes it look like you're yelling or shouting at the recipient. Nothing that you want to do. Okay, an example of that would be saying, do you understand? That sounds like you're yelling at the person who's reading the email. We don't want to do that. Tip number four. Although it can be really tempting, especially if you're upset, it's very important to avoid sarcasm. 
it's already very difficult to decipher tone in an email. And also, sarcasm is often construed as passive aggressive. An example of that might be, thanks for the F you gave me on the assignment I worked really hard on. Hey, that can be really, really rude to the recipient, and then the recipient is more likely to just tune you out and not do what you want them to do. Tip number five. Now this is really important. It's important that you don't email when you're angry. When you email when you're angry, you're more likely to say something that you're going to regret later. Besides, there are just some topics that are better to discuss in person. Furthermore, like we already talked about, words are read differently than they are heard. And so when you email when you're really upset, you're more likely to offend the recipient. A good tip to follow is wait at least 24 hours before you send an email. Tip number six, avoid blaming others and making excuses. Take responsibility and ownership. A note for you, never accuse someone for an issue you're facing, even if they are to blame. Otherwise, the accused is more likely to get defensive and then they're less likely to partner with you to do what you want them to do. Tip number seven, be specific. When you're writing the email, be clear and mention the specifics. Your teacher has many students, and so it's very important to include all of the necessary details about the issue you're facing. An example of this. Okay, last spring, I received an email that said, I didn't understand the assignment from last week. The question was really confusing. Well, if we're talking about an assignment from last week, there was probably two or three different assignments. So which assignment are you talking about? Also, I probably asked a lot of questions last week. Which question was really confusing? So when you send an email that's really vague, like the example, it leads me with a lot of questions. And then I have to do some, I have to send you questions in regards to your email, and it makes the process not very efficient. Tip number eight is to be concise. Say what you need in a few sentences or less while still being specific. So on this slide, I've given you two examples. One example is not concise and the other is. The example that shows a non-concise answer says, I was really bored in class, so I had a hard time paying attention. I drew a lot of doodles all over my notebook instead of taking notes. Now I'm confused. Can you explain what a non-restrictive phrase is again? Or you could just say, can you direct me to extra resources that will help me better understand non-restrictive phrases? When we're more concise, the recipient is more likely to read our email, and so then they're more likely to respond faster. Tip number nine, if you cannot avoid sending a long email, use bullets when possible. So you can use bulleted questions or statements because they're easier to read, they're easier to mentally organize, and they're easier to remember. Number 10, although you might be tempted, don't email asking for extra credit. Most of the time when students do this, they haven't completed some of the mandatory, mandatory coursework that was assigned. Also, if your grade isn't where you know it can be, Try to talk to your teacher in person about your concerns if possible. Tip number 11 states that you should include your first and last name in the signature block after a complimentary close. An example might be, thank you, sincerely, my best, and then you would include your first and last name. Tip number 12 asks you to allow for response time. You should try to allow your teacher at least 24 hours to reply to your email. Never email requesting something ASAP. It's very rude. Tip number 13. If you have an email or if you have to email about something negative, it's important to try to use the flattery sandwich approach. This technique is way more persuasive and it makes your recipient more likely to do what it is you want them to do. So to use the flattery sandwich, you would first start with a positive comment. 
Then you could state your request or your complaint as gently and respectfully as possible. And then it would be a good idea to end on a note of positivity and thankfulness. And we have tip number 14. Before you hit send, make sure you proofread your email. Try to fix any spelling or grammatical errors. Typically, the most frequent errors within an email are capitalization and punctuation errors. Also, consider using the spell check feature to find any tricky spelling errors. Now that I've covered the basics about email etiquette and I've shared some tips with you, these are our next steps. So we have just completed our email um, notes. Next, I'd like you to complete the Email Etiquette 101, the basics assignment on Schoology. In the next few days, I'd like you to complete the Evaluating Emails assignment. You should watch the Professional Email Elements video and take notes. I'd like you to take the assessment, the Professional Email Elements assessment on Schoology. And then your last step is to complete the Email Etiquette final assessment on Schoology. So you'll find each one of these assignments and lecture videos um, in our Email Etiquette 101 unit on Schoology. Thanks for watching, everyone.